Welcome everybody to the ESMO module on Respectful Maternity Care. It's wonderful to have us all sitting like we are. No pages are needed, no pens, no papers, no desks. We're sitting facing each other in this horseshoe so that we can connect with each other and learn from each other. To, just to remind everybody, there are no right or wrong answers. We want to engage in a discussion, in a debate. It's going to be fantastic if people disagree, if people come with different ideas, different personal, professional experiences, so that we can learn together to provide mothers with, the, with respectful maternity care. We're going to learn today why that's important, why it often doesn't happen, and some skills that we can use to train others to, to provide empathic, care for mothers in the best possible way, because we know that this has the best outcomes um, from an obstetric point of view and from a mental health point of view. It also has the best outcomes um, in terms of professional satisfaction and motivation. My name is Simon Honigman, this is Jason Marcus, and he will be starting us today. Thanks, Simon. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, so we're just going to do a bit of background uh, around the module. Or, uh, so the aims for it are to give you the ability to recognize disrespect when you see it, okay? um, to understand some of the causes of why women are abused and disrespected when they seek care in our facilities, to create some awareness in yourself about the attitudes that contribute to disrespectful care and abuse. And we're going to give it a go in practicing some of these skills um, on how to empathically engage with patients. And then towards the end, we're going to talk a bit about the WHO Safe Childbirth Checklist, uh, which has started to be rolled out internationally and now locally as well. Now, throughout the world, I mean, there are papers from the 1950s reporting around disrespect that women receive in maternity facilities. Uh, that initial paper from 1952 was and from some facilities out in the United States. So it's not just something that happens here, it happens across the world. Now there's some data to suggest that about 16% of women experience some form of disrespect or abuse in South Africa. My feeling is that that is not so, I think it's more prevalent than 16%. Um, and it's not a soft issue, because as was said um, earlier by Simone, there there are certain outcomes attached to abuse and disrespect that women receive, okay? Bad outcomes, and we need to be mindful and we need to remember that. And the consequences can be quite dire for the mother and her baby, All right? Now, the consequences range from things like post-traumatic stress disorder, okay? How many times have you spoken to women who are just absolutely so afraid of having more children because of the treatment she received, rather than the experience of the birth. If people feel abused, they're less likely to want to come to the facility. They're less likely to seek care because they're not treated well, so I'd rather not go where I'm, I'm disrespectful. And the, and the most vulnerable in society are the people that, that this kind of behavior would deter from attending. We know we've got a large amount of foreign national patients that's all clients that seek our care. They are treated differently, aren't they? Have you seen this? They are treated differently to the locals, okay? They're less likely to come. Young mothers, teenagers, the way they are treated by the staff makes them not want to attend for care. And then we still blame them when things go wrong, okay? Because this is a reality out there. Um, Tocophobia, fear of childbirth, because if she feels unsafe, the labor is going to be a problem, isn't it? The birth is going to be a problem. Okay? And we, there's an increasing move, particularly in the private sector, for women deciding to have cesarean sections and not understanding the risks. And we get, we're doing them, or we get, get providing the service of cesarean section for reasons other than obstetric indications. Okay? And when people don't receive the care that they deserve by virtue of them being human beings, that causes a rift between the providers, which is us, and 
the patients, the community. Because we all know our stories where certain health centers, certain hospitals, certain <coughs> clinics have a reputation. We all know of these where the community thinks a certain way about the facility, not so. All right. And once that trust is broken, it's very difficult to regain. Okay. And in all of that, if women don't come for care because they're disrespected, things go wrong, it only negatively influences our morbidity and mortality rates. Does that make sense to you? Any question before we carry on? Now, if I were to ask you what is abuse, how would you, and disrespect, if we're talking about in the clinical care environment, what would you say constitutes abuse? Somebody not feeling welcome. Somebody not feeling welcome, right, okay. Being scolded at. Being scolded at, okay, for, for no reason in most instances, right. Maltreated, yeah, or treated badly. Any other thoughts? Yep, compromising their dignity by doing what? By shouting and scolding at them? By belt maltreatment? Not providing privacy. Not providing privacy. Absolutely. Yes, or just not that, that non welcoming thing. Or, no, it's two o'clock. We're not going to see you now. We've seen that happen. But isn't the working hours till four? So you see where, where how it creeps in. It's those little things, not little, it's big things. All right, so there's physical abuse where you, where women are manhandled, slapped during labor, right? Legs pried apart. Speculum is being inserted without permission. Okay, that's all of that. Pinching. We know this happens. Patients report it all the time. Okay. There's the non-dignified care and so shouting at people. Right, like they are children. Okay, that's a form of abuse. Non-confidential care where we just talk openly about a patient to somebody else in front of other patients or speaking at the top of our voices behind the curtain to the patient. That's non-confidential care because we, we're breaching confidentiality by allowing others to hear what we're saying to the patient. Okay. By saying, uh, those that are coming for the city for come this house, come this way. Exactly. Absolutely. I see some lights going on there. What, what's going through your mind? No, I just see your, it's like your hard drive is just firing away. <laughs> what are you thinking? It's not actually inside of when you say to the woman, just push, I was not there. Exactly. That's that non-dignified care. That's looking down on her. Non-consensual care. Just lie down here. I need to check if your water's broke and I'll put in a speculum. That's non-consensual. She didn't tell you. Right? Or the consultants talking by the patient to the junior staff, whatever. Okay, so we're going to do a Caesar now. We're going to do a Caesar now and walks away and then somebody else goes and then takes consent, but the decision was made without her. That's abuse. Am I making sense? We see this happening. Okay? Neglect and abandonment of, abandonment of care, like you said. She doesn't want to listen. You just do your own thing. I'm going now. This happens. Get on the bed. Instinctively, she doesn't want to be there. Because remember, we interfere in childbirth, don't we? We're the interferers there. If you don't want to listen, you don't want to lay on your back, you just push your child out yourself, I'm going to go sit outside. 
and call me when the baby's out. This is what happens. That's abuse. And when there's an emergency, nobody addresses them. But sorry for the delay. We're still having an emergency. So exactly. Just as if, they're not there. if they're not, if they don't exist. I'm not sure how big this problem is in South Africa, but this is also a form of abuse, where people have to pay before they leave. I know in other countries they have fees, because we know in South Africa <coughs> maternity care is free for everybody, even if you are a foreign national. Because people are still being held against their will in facilities because they can't provide documentation. And that is that is a human rights infringement, withholding a per person's freedom of movement. Okay? It is not your job to monitor their movements in the country. It's not your job. You're there to provide care and make sure that mother and baby live healthy and well. Not hold on to them because a, demo, uh, a bureaucratic process prevents you from, or prevents her from leaving. Am I making sense? Yes. That's not our job. Our job is to make sure that mom and baby are well. That's it. Okay. And that goes with the inappropriate detention in the facilities. Okay. As well. Am I making sense? Yes. Are there any questions or comments? Are these things causing you to think about what you've seen? Yes. And done? Yes. Okay. And done. Yes. I'm glad that you're agreeing because everywhere else we go, say, no, we don't do this. But we know they're lying. <laughs> okay. So, do you get the gist of where we're going with this? Yes. All right. Now, there are many reasons why this occurs. Okay. There's attitude problems among staff. Okay. And abuse during pregnancy and childbirth is a gender-based thing. Okay. And not from men to women only but women to women. Making sense? All right. There's the power relation issue. I'm the midwife, I'm the doctor, I'm the nurse, and you will just listen to me. Not so. That's that one. Then, oh, here's the doctor, I'm the midwife, I need to listen to what this person says, even if it's wrong from an ethical, moral, or just a professional point of view. But you still do it because of that power struggle. Or the unit manager being absolutely dictatorial about how the ward or the facility is run and not accepting anybody's way of thinking other than his or her, herself. And that, and that negativity does influence the provider's ability to provide Good, clean, ethical, compassionate care. I don't feel taken care of, so I won't take care of you. Does that make sense? Or where somebody is doing the right thing, but the group thinks, no, but why is he or she doing it like that? That's the right thing, but we don't do it that way, so we ostracize that person. People are afraid of doing the right thing for being judged and criticized by their colleagues. This happens. Okay. Um, people are demoralized, the system. Okay? So you can't just fix up the person, the frontline person. You have to fix up the context in which they work. All right? And particularly amongst uh, midwives and nurses, there's very, very scanty kind of professional development. Because up until recently, you had people in practice for 20 years who haven't attended any course, attended any continuing education activity, nor opened a book or a journal. Okay? But now that CPD is starting to come about, right? And what this does, it causes people to do things the way they've always done it. You've heard that story, we've always done it like this. All right? There was, a, you remember where. Some of you might remember when every primigravida was given an episiotomy. Mm -hmm. Why? Because that's the way we've always done it. There's no there was no evidence to support it. So that's part of the 
bad practices that we no longer do. Okay. And managers are very far removed from what happens at the coalface in terms of what people experience there. Because all they look at is numbers and budgets and this, that, and the other. And where um, administrative staff, procurement officers, they make decisions about clinical care equipment and supplies. That shouldn't be. They must do the job of getting the stuff based on what the end user inputs have been. Because how many times have you come to a facility and there's only pink jalcos? Right? You've seen this. In a maternity unit, only pink jalcos because the procurement officer, this was the cheapest on the tender and that's what we got. That's not what you need. So that kind of lack of respect for your professional judgment and, and so on. Okay. Um, the next part is the fun part. So I'm going to take a step back. I'll be the scribe and Simone will run the next bit.